So let's think about Isaiah for just a few moments. And we're just going to be here for a few moments tonight. You're like, Stephen, we've heard that before. Um, <laughs> think about Isaiah and this passage of Scripture that Doug just shared with us a few moments ago from Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. And it says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the everlasting Father. He does not grow tired or weary. His, his understanding you cannot fathom. Even youth, and we've got some youth here, they will grow tired and weary. But those who wait on the Lord... If you wait on the Lord, he shall renew your strength and mount up with wings like eagles, and you shall soar. You ever watched an eagle soar before? It's a beautiful sight. And you will walk and not grow tired. You will run and not grow weary. So tonight we're talking about patience and waiting, and they, they do go together. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you took time to laugh, to dance, and to love? Can you even remember that? You know, this is the age of half-read articles. You know what I'm talking about. My phone, I know yours does too, and email, get inundated with articles and even devotions and podcasts that people send me and want me to listen to. And You get those things too. I know you get a lot of stuff from the church, and if we're honest, we half read them or we don't read them at all. Do you know it takes the average person seven times to receive information before they actually get it? So if there's an announcement that needs to go out, it needs to be announced to you seven times and in different ways. So we have to get creative in this day and age with marketing. It's a very difficult thing to do. This is the age where we quick trip to the store. We don't even have to go to the store. We can get somebody to do our shopping for us and bring us our groceries and our food. Uber Eats, you've heard of that before, haven't you? So everything's on the go and really fast. The quick layover, fast food, and the brief stop, the fake suntan in a brief span, the drive-by COVID shot so as not to waste time, the FaceTime visit with children or grandchildren, and the fun's done. That's it. That's the way we communicate with folks. And because we've gotten so used to that during the pandemic, I'm a little afraid that that might become the norm. That it's just going to be easier just to FaceTime than go and actually travel and see family and be with them in person and hold that grandchild. Oh, we can just Zoom and not worry about getting out there and contracting something or getting in a car accident. We'll just Zoom or we'll just text or we'll just FaceTime. Or we'll just call. But nothing replaces physical touch, being together, even worship. The author of Hebrews says, let us not give up on worshiping and being together. So important for us to do that, folks. Somebody put this on Facebook recently. I'd seen it before. Busyness is not a badge of honor. You know how you go around and you'll say, hey, I'm busy. And you want to justify everything that you're doing. People even call you and say, hey, you been busy? <laughs> you got a couple of hours? I'll tell you what I've been doing. You know what I'm saying? We think it's stylish to be busy, and we feel guilty when we're not. When we're not always doing something like Jojo the Clown, you know? We feel guilty about it. But it doesn't have to be that way, does it? No. If it's that way in your life today, chances are it's because you made it that way. And the only one who can make it different is you. You're the one that can make it different. You say you're busy. Can I say something to you? We're all busy, aren't we? Even those who are retired, you know you filled your schedule up. My mom and dad are busier than they've ever been, and they've been retired now for several years. Who says you can't enjoy life even when the pace picks up? God doesn't say that. I don't care if our to-do list is as long as the horizon. We need to get back in balance and take time to laugh and to dance and to love and notice the beautiful foliage in the fall. Have you seen what God has done? Have you even noticed 
Well, the next time you look up will be, where did all the leaves go? Man, it's kind of depressing. You have missed out on one of the most beautiful falls we've had because we actually had a lot of rain this season. So the leaves are gorgeous. Our youth group's going on a retreat this coming week. It's supposed to be peak season. We're going to historic banding meals. We're going to do the longest, highest tree flight canopy tour in the Western Hemisphere. It's going to be amazing, and it's going to be beautiful. We're going to be like 100 or so feet above the tree line, and we'll get to see God's glorious creation. And they're going to take the time to do that. They've got a lot going on, but they're going to take the weekend to go and grow in Christ. You want to know what the theme of our retreat is? You ever heard of Lord of the Rings? The theme is Lord of the Kings. That will be a T-shirt, shouldn't it? It's going to be so cool. Oh, I can't wait. It's going to be really good. So why do we want to take time to do that sort of thing? Because the Bible says so. Furthermore, your family and friends will enjoy you a lot more when you do. The psalmist said in Psalm 1611, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God wants us to have pleasure. He wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to experience the fullness of his joy, which is different, S.J., thanks for reminding us, from happiness. Happiness is temporary. But the joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. And joy lasts for eternity if that joy comes from God. We're foregoing so much joy because our happiness comes from a box, a bag, a bottle, a TV series. And our families are taking a hard hit. So are our marriages. I'm thankful that these couples that went on the marriage retreat, they, they, it, was, it was intentionality to do that. They take time to come out of the chaos of the noise and the busyness and just be together and grow over that weekend. Every couple was saying, when do we go on the next one? We can't wait. We would go tomorrow if we could. So we're going to plan another one, maybe in the spring, and hopefully all of you will be a part of that, that are married. You know, American culture is probably the hardest place in the world to slow down and to wait and to pray. Business is a lifestyle, isn't it? We're so busy that we can't even slow down to pray, and we find it uncomfortable when we do because we prize accomplishments, production, but prayer is nothing but talking to God. And for some people, it just feels useless, as if we're wasting time. We try to pray, and our bodies and our bones are screaming, get back to work. You need to be doing something. You're wasting time. You don't have time for this. Just skim through it real quick. That way you can say you did it. I did my devotion. Is that really the way of having intimacy with the God who created you? The purpose for your life? And it's that much of a drudgery? I hope not. When we aren't working or going to school, we're used to being entertained. Television, the internet, video games, cell phones make free time as busy as work. I mean, you know it's true. You're standing in line in the grocery store. What do you pull out while you're standing in line? And you're already, you're already upset because all you have is like three or four items in your little you know, hand thing you're holding there or your little teeny cart. And then the person in front of you has got 50 items there and they're in the express lane and you're getting mad. So you just pull out your phone. You start checking your status. You start checking the score of the game. Start checking, you know, whatever. Even when you're in line at the drive-thru, it happens. And you find yourself even doing it when you're out to dinner or around the dinner table with your family and friends. It comes out, out of the purse or the pocket. And you got family sitting around you. And you got a spouse sitting across the table from you or a dear friend. And there you go. What does that say to that person or that family or that person you work with that needed you to go out to lunch with them so they could be vulnerable and be transparent with you and tell you about their broken marriage or their addiction? And yet, whatever it is you're checking is more important than they are. That's what it says, folks. We need to think about that. That's American culture. And when we slow down, when we finally slow down and we do something for ourselves or for our spouse or for our family, we slip into a stupor. <laughs> we do. And we're guilty. We feel guilty about it. I need to be working. I need to be doing this. I need to be checking this. Don't have time for this. 
So exhausted by the pace of life, when we get home in the evenings, we veg out in front of a screen, whether that's the screen of our phone or the TV. Maybe we've got our earplugs in or our AirPods, as they call them. If we try to be quiet, we're assaulted by what C.S. Lewis called the kingdom of noise. Everywhere we go, we hear background noise. If noise isn't provided, we can bring our own via iPod. Even our church services have to have that restless energy. We always got to be doing something. There's little space to be still for God. And when we do, it feels awkward. We want our money's worth. So something should always be happening. I should always be stimulated at all times. And so it's even hard to lay down at night and go to sleep because our minds are racing. We haven't taken time to be still before the Lord. And so we can't sleep. And we lay there and we worry in our mind races about the things we didn't do and the things we need to do the next day and about our finances and about our broken relationships and whatever else and our health. Because we're living such a paced life, we can't even take time to go get a physical. And we're not eating the right foods. And we're not taking our medications the way we're supposed to take them. We are very uncomfortable with silence. We are. Very uncomfortable with silence. You are right now. And I just paused here for a second. You're like, okay, did he forget what he's going to say? What's going to happen next? Come on, let's go. We've got things to do. We're going to dinner tonight. We've got trick-or-treaters coming. That's all you've heard. You probably haven't heard anything I've said because you're that consumed. It's true, folks. Think about this for a second. Our trust in ourselves and in our talents make us structurally independent of God. As a result, exhortations to pray don't stick. We can't pray then more like two seconds or, or 30 seconds and to pray more than a minute. And there's no way I can do that. There's too much going on. When Jesus describes the intimacy he wants with us, he's talking about prayer. He talks about joining us for dinner. Do you remember there was a time when you used to have that intimacy around the dinner table? I don't know if that's an art anymore or not. People even do that. I grew up. Our most precious, intimate times as a family was around the dinner table, which something, someone, usually the female in the family, had prepared for us. And we sat around the table and we enjoyed each other's company and we got an update on our day and how things were going and we had beautiful prayer around the table. Jesus says this in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Slowing down and praying creates an experience in which we connect to the living God. If you're not connecting to the vine, then you are wilting. You're melting like the witch in the withered of Oz. I'm melting. You're melting. You're withering. You're fading away. Oddly enough, many people struggle to learn how to pray because they are focusing on praying, not on God. I've got to pray the right way. I've got to say the right thing. I've got to sound good before God. Oh, and if I get up before the congregation, I've really got to sound good. I've got to be prepared. Making prayer the center is like making conversation the center of a family mealtime. In prayer, focusing on the conversation is like trying to drive while looking at the windshield instead of looking through it. Can you imagine what that would be like? It freezes us, making us unsure of where to go. Conversation is the only vehicle through which we experience one another. Through prayer, getting to know God is our focus. We are developing an intimacy with the living, almighty God who created us and gave us life. And he's given us a beautiful way to connect with him if we will come out of the chaos of the busyness and the noise and hear his still, small voice. The psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Put me first, for I am the king of kings. I am the Lord of lords. And yes, I am a jealous God. I want all of you. I don't want part of you. I don't want three minutes. I want the whole day. And you can give him the whole day, even if you're working. You can realize everything that I do is to glorify the Lord and to give him praise and to give him thanks. He is my reason for being. 
I'm here to glorify him. I'm here to tell others about him, and I will enjoy him now and for eternity. Because of my faithfulness in him, I have the promise of eternity within me right now. And nothing, no surgery, no failed surgery, no ailment is going to keep me from his great love and that promise of eternity and a new and abundant life. Prayer is about relationship. We need to be in constant communication with God. We can't work on prayer as an isolated part of life. That would be like, I want you to listen to this young people back there. This is funny. If you work on prayer as an isolated part of life, it's separated from the rest of your life. You see, my grandmother, whom SJ and I used to pray for every day, all the way until she passed, my grandmother, Alan, she would pray without ceasing, and she never ended her prayers with amen. You've heard me say this before, because she was always in a prayer frame of mind. She's always praying, so she didn't say amen. I love that. I've tried to adapt that in my own life, just to have a lifestyle of prayer. Nothing wrong with that. But we can't work on prayer as an isolated part of life. That would be like going to the gym and working out just your, your left arm. <laughs> I mean, you'd get a strong left arm. It would be nice and massive and defined triceps and all that. But you'd have this little peony little arm over here, you know. It would look odd. People are like, look, <laughs> you know. Let me just say this. If we love people and have power to help, then we're going to be busy. And that's okay. If you're helping people and you're loving people and taking care of people, it's okay. That's, be busy like that. But make sure you have self-awareness, which leads you to self-care, that you're taking care of yourself. And the best way to do that is to slow down and even say, Lord, slow me down. There used to be an old spiritual called, slow me down, Lord, because I'm tired, Lord. I'm tired. Slow me down. And if there's anything I'm doing that doesn't bring glory to you, if there's anything I'm doing that's not about you, May I fail at it miserably. And let me know what I need to do to be who you created me to be in the first place. And you thought you might get a less message tonight because, you know, it's Halloween and we came back from a marriage retreat. But I'm going to tell you something. You need to share this message with everybody that you can because it's not my message. It's God's message to you. And that's what happens, John, every single Sunday at Misty Creek. It's what the Holy Spirit wants you to hear. He wants you to apply these words and this truth to your everyday life so you will continue to be the person he created you to be in the first place, the person that he molded and knitted in your mother's womb and gave you his life. The air that you breathe is not your own air. It comes from above. It comes from a holy God. Learning to pray doesn't offer you a less busy life. Hear this. Learning to pray doesn't offer you a less busy life. It offers you a less busy heart. The attitude of your heart tells a lot about who you are. In the midst of our busyness, we can develop an inner quiet because we are less hectic on the inside, we have a greater capacity to love and thus to be busy, which in turn drives us even more into a life of prayer because you get refueled by praying. You're able to love more by praying. You're able to connect more by praying. You're able to have more intimacy with your spouse and with your family and friends through prayer, through God, who is the focus of our prayer. Spending time with our Father in prayer, we integrate our lives with His, with what He is doing in us. Our lives become more coherent, more meaningful. They feel calmer, more ordered, even in the midst of confusion and pressure, because God is not the author of confusion and pressure or worry or guilt. He's not into that kind of thing. And if you are, then that means you're lacking a prayer life and a connection with God because he doesn't want you to be that way. He doesn't want you to be stressed out and filled with anxiety all the time. He wants you to live an abundant life. But Jesus reminds us that Satan has come to kill and destroy. But what did Jesus come to do? He came to give you an abundant life. And a, and a consistent prayer life, folks, is not something you accomplish overnight. There's a group from this church that meets every Thursday night at 7 p.m. And the Holy Spirit shows up in a mighty way. And He speaks through us and He prays through us. He intercedes for us. And we intercede for you and for those that are watching. 
It's called intercessory prayer. We pray on your behalf. We pray for you by name many times in the situations that are going on. So it's the journey of a lifetime, praying and slowing down. The same is true of learning how to love your spouse or a good friend. You never stop learning this side of heaven. There were some couples on the marriage retreat that had been married 30, 40, 50 plus years because they realized we're we're never going to stop learning how to be closer to one another, how to have more intimacy, how to have the relationship God wants us to have. We want to be poured into so we can pour out and into others. You have an opportunity to do that. John and Vicki, your story, you're going to be able to pour that into people. You're going to be able to show them the love of God through all that you've been through. And there's going to be healing. When we share our our weakness and our struggles and our hurt and our pain with other people and they share theirs, that weakness and that pain and those inadequacies lose their power over us. They don't have any control over us, do they, Carrie? They don't. Because we serve a God who gives us a greater power to overcome anything in our lives. And busyness can overcome you. And God does not want you to be overwhelmed anymore. When you give your spouse time, he or she gives you the gift of himself or herself. When you give your children and family your time, they give you the gift of themselves. And when you give God your time, your life, your heart, guess what? He gives you his very essence. He gives you himself. He gives you his spirit. And he makes you whole and he makes you new. And you're a new creation in Christ. And the old you is gone and the new you steps forward. And people will see that Christ lives in you. And they will want that as God's spirit is oozing out of you. They will want that. And they will ask you, how did you get that? How is it that you have such energy and strength and I'm tired all the time. How are you able to be so positive? How are you able to do for so many other people? And you'll be able to say, well, it's not me. I'm not doing any of that. It's the everlasting God within me. It's the strength of God that's within me. It's his power. It's his spirit. It's nothing that I'm doing. And let me tell you how that goes. And then you can share your story of where God brought you, where he brought, what he brought you out of. And you can share that newness of life with someone else, folks. That's what it's all about. And so I want to remind you tonight that happiness does not come from a box or a bag or a television set. You know, there's not very much in this to make you happy, to be honest with you. I got the wrong box here, but anyway, in this box are a few items. It's the smallest little french fry you've ever seen, folks. It's the teeniest little thing. Holds like six french fries. The chicken nuggets, when you open it up, there are usually three. If you're lucky, there are four chicken nuggets, but they can really only fit three in the box. And then the little drink is this big. It has like 20 pieces of ice in it, so there's like a half ounce of drink in there. And then the toy, you know where the toy ends up going? Up under the bed somewhere. And then while mom, maybe dad if you're domestic, is vacuuming, it ends up in the vacuum cleaner and it rips the vacuum cleaner apart. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? There's no happiness in that. We want joy. And the joy that Jesus is talking about is eternal joy. And you can have it now. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we want that kind of joy. We don't want the temporary happiness. We want the joy of the Lord. Because you are our strength. You're our everlasting God. And our hope is in you. So this evening, Lord... We would ask that you would send forth your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to spend time with you. Help us to pray. Help us to take time to come out of the chaos of the noise and hear your still, small voice. Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to slow down and learn from you because we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And you tell us, all who are weary and tired and exhausted, come, come to me and I will give you rest. And so we rest in you, Lord. Slow us down. Fill us with your supernatural energy and your spirit. Help us to rest. 
to rest in the arms of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.